you know, when I heard the topic from George, uh, I mean, I'm just excited about stuff like this. I mean, it, it's just, it's, it's just unbelievable that we have such interesting geology just in our own solar system. And, uh, you know, I think it's safe to say you're, uh, you're an expert on ice. That's kind of what it, I think it boils down to and, and how ice interacts with different materials and the thermodynamics and, and the chemistry behind all of that in lots of different cool places in our solar system. Um, so Dr. Aaron's got her undergraduate degree at uh, West Virginia University, and then you went on to get your doctorate at the University of Arkansas, I believe, and you're now working at the Goddard Space Flight Center doing, doing crazy cool things, and it is, uh, it is really great to have you and appreciate your time tonight, so I'll kind of turn it over to you. Now, I will say if folks have questions, and we love questions, um, you know, if you have to have the answer right away, I think ask your question, but it's probably preferred if you put it in the chat box in our in our little app here, and uh, we can kind of roll them up at the end kind of more conveniently. So um, with that, I'll just make sure you can unmute and everything, Caitlin, and, uh, and uh, we'll turn the meeting over to you. Thank you. Great. Awesome. So you can hear me? Yep. Sounds good. Right. All right. Uh, so yes, I do study ice, uh, which uh, is quite entertaining to say the least, because you would think ice, like, okay, you know, if you have ice in your freezer, you can make your drinks cold. You know, what's, what's so fascinating about that? But ice can really change a lot of geology in the outer solar system. And I'll be uh, talking about ice and how ice plays a major role in volcanic systems in the outer solar system, but we're going to span all across the solar system uh, with uh, with space volcanism. So it's it's, a, it's such a fascinating topic uh, to be sure because some are chunky, some are squishy, some are geysers, some are little itty bitty domes, and so there's all these different kinds of structures that we truly have no idea what in the world is going on. But that's the fun part. So if I were to ask you, what is a volcano? If I were to just simply ask you to draw a volcano, very much Pictionary style here, it would probably look something like this. Just some sort of uh, concave looking uh, mountain of some sort, some sort of vent at the top. But usually we associate volcanism to be very dynamic, um, ash clouds, something explosive popping out of it, maybe some runny lava uh, flowing out of it. So, you know, this is my great artistic skills here. Uh, and that would be somewhat correct, but not fully. So this is the earth definition of a volcano, some sort of mountain or hill, typically conical of some sort, having a vent on top in which some sort of lava, and this could be uh, rock fragments, it could be vapor and gas, um, but something erupting out of that vent and essentially just something from the mantle spewing forth uh, and usually something hot and, and sticky. So in a case, yes, uh, so the uh, fantastic example are the Hawaiian volcanoes and we send many planetary people out to Hawaii and also Iceland. Uh, to study those particular types of volcanic systems for the solar system. Uh, but Hawaiian volcanoes are very uh, dynamic. And uh, but looking at earth volcanism in general, you can have all different shapes and sizes. You can have different kinds of plate tectonics going on, different fault systems. Uh, calderas. So calderas are where you have some sort of uh, uh, buildup of material and it builds up and it builds up and it builds up. And then all of a sudden that building up just cannot take its internal weight anymore and it collapses. Uh, so if anything, it's like us on a Friday night after a long work week, you know, we just collapse. Uh, so, you know, we become the caldera uh, and, uh, and all that rock uh, and magma just uh, sinks back into the ground and, and makes a large pit. So comparing Earth systems and our planetary systems, like I said, we send a bunch of planetary geologists out to the field uh, to study a lot of Earth systems and then try to figure out, oh, can we, can we match what we're seeing here on Earth to other planetary systems? And sometimes yes, 
but there's times when we're like, what is going on here? What what is happening at this asteroid or dwarf planet or planet and moon and, and whatnot? It, it's so fascinating. So these are just a couple very brief examples. On the left, you would see um, a caldera system with some beautiful uh, fault stretch marks here on Mars. And then you see a caldera system, a very small one uh, on Earth. And same thing here. Uh, on the left is Mars again. So these are considered cones. Uh, very small, only a couple kilometers uh, large. And then the same thing here on Earth as well. So volcanic cones. So comparing not only the shape and size and morphology of these structures, but what about the chemistry? What about uh, the biological um, sense of everything. So astrobiology would be really good um, into, <laughs> into figuring out the volcanic systems on, especially on some of those icy moons as well. If we're assuming that there's a lot of very warm oceans out there, there might be some interesting astrobiological uh, stuff out there too. So uh, the moment you've been waiting for now is let's get right to it. Solar system volcanoes are how I like to call it the pretty picture time. Uh, we're going to start with planet numero uno with Mercury. So Mercury, though, not very exciting with volcanism, unfortunately. There's no vents. There's no mountain structures or anything. But you have these small puddles of lava flows um, that have essentially just puddled upward, and we just call them filled in planes. Now, not to sound gross or anything though, but how these essentially work is kind of like scabbing. Um, so we do essentially call, uh, essentially call these scabs. Uh, so what happens is that the interior of Mercury is still, uh, it's not dynamic anymore, but still pretty fluid in, in some sense. It's very hot, but it's still very fluid. And what happens with Mercury though, is that it gets pinpricked too many times that the subsurface, all that slush and stuff, just kind of bleeds and just kind of trickles onto the surface and then immediately crystallizes. Um, and so this is why we call them scabs. It's just, it's all that little trickling and then crystallizing and, and just scabbing over whatever it's covered. So it would have covered craters, it would have covered um, any previous uh, fault systems or anything like that, and just create these little puddles um, of lava. So not terribly exciting. Venus can be quite exciting. Uh, so it has the most volcanoes in the whole solar system, at least more than a thousand that we were able to observe thus far. Now, images with Venus aren't exactly the best thing in the world. Uh, the best we have is from the Magellan uh, orbiter, and even that can get pretty low res. We can't see if there's like really tiny uh, volcanic systems due to resolution. So, you know, that's as best as we can get. But you know what? Detecting over a thousand volcanoes on Venus, I, I think we're doing pretty good. Now, the current debate is, are they still alive? Are they dormant? Or are they just absolutely dead? No more volcanism, no more eruptions, and, and Venus is, is just geologically dead. People are on, still on the fence about this, actually. Uh, and we have a couple missions coming up for Venus uh, pretty soon, and I'll get to those uh, later. But understanding that a lot of these volcanic systems on Venus are pretty similar to Earth, except the fact that the pressure and temperature of Venus is extreme. So a lovely spring day on Venus is about 900 degrees Fahrenheit. Woo. Uh, so, uh, so having all of the iron and magnesium and sulfur type volcanism it's just slush. So you're not going to be able to have very big mountains uh, on Venus that well. So Venus obviously has a very luscious, thick atmosphere. So it really took us a while to figure out uh, using topography maps now. Um, do we wish Venus was this colorful? Absolutely, but no. So this is uh, an altitude map. So the pink and whiter areas are the very high altitudes. And then the purple and blue areas are the lower latitude or uh, low altitudes there. But there's three different kinds of vol uh, volcanic systems on Venus. We have your pancakes, your ticks, and your shields. So shield volcanoes are uh, definitely the easiest to make, and shields are uh, certainly the 
uh, more prevalent across the solar system. All volcanic uh, um, systems on Mars are considered shields. Uh, they're really not that hard to make. Now, pancakes and, and ticks can get quite interesting. So pancakes, think of it as you will as just Venus having pimples. Uh, so you would have just a very fluffy iron magnesium uh, slush, just kind of building up, building up, building up. And, but very, very fluffy uh, materials. So nothing much to them, but they just rising up and that's about it. <laughs> so, so we do call them pancakes. Now, if those pancakes get in, uh, larger and they grow and they grow and they grow, the fluffiness tends to get a little, little too much for the crust and it sinks down into the crust so hard it cracks the surface and we call these ticks because the cracking of the surface makes it look like legs popping out of a pancake here and when they look like little bugs kind of skittering across the surface so we call them ticks. Um, but then very rarely we'll, we will get very large um, beautiful shield volcanoes and this is Mott Mons, one of the largest volcanoes on Venus. But when I mean large, it's not um, that much larger. So Mount St. Helens is about 1300 meters, Mott Mons is about 8000 meters. So pretty good comparison there. Not the largest though. We'll get to the largest one here in a bit. Uh, so the moon. Similar to Mercury in the fact that there's not large mountains or anything. Um, uh, there's there's purely lava plains, no venting, very minor venting, if anything. Uh, but you have mares and you have domes. So mare, Latin for oceans, uh, the beautiful dark areas. If anybody's done the, uh, the lunar observing um, program from the Astronomical League, you would probably get to see, you know, all, uh, try to figure out all where all the mare is and everything. It's just gorgeous to image uh, if anybody does astrophotography with the moon. Just, mare is just gorgeous. Uh, but all that mare and understanding the different minerals, the different iron, uh, how it would have flooded the plains of the moon, that is still being studied uh, to this day. So there's Mare, and then like I said, there's lunar domes. And we want to try to uh, get a mission to at least these particular type of, uh, of uh, volcanic domes. This is the Grutizen region. Uh, so domes similar to Venusian pancakes, just a little buildup of material to create these like little domes, but usually associated with uh, fault systems or graben or even riles. Uh, on the lunar surface. And they could come in all short, sorts of shapes and sizes, um, Brutizen, and also there's uh, the Marius Hills, around Marius Crater, come in clusters. All right, so Mars. Oh, I could talk about Mars for hours on end. Oh my goodness, Mars has some very bizarre geology. And I'm, you know, by all means, I'd be happy to come back and, and just chat about Mars for a whole evening. Uh, so the composition of Mars is pretty similar uh, to Earth. So that, who you know what? That makes makes the math a lot easier. Uh, it makes figuring out the geologic systems a lot easier too. Uh, so when I mean it's basalt, it's what we would see at Hawaii and Iceland. Uh, the problem though is there's no plate tectonics. There's no plate tectonics on, on any of these things. So how do you figure there would be large volcanic systems without the, the uh, squishing of, of plates together and forming mountains. So how Hawaii, a lot of the uh, arc islands of Hawaii is by hotspots. So we're probably thinking Mars probably had something similar to that, where he had just these large magma chambers just hanging out in the subsurface of Mars and then bubbling up uh, very, very slowly, like a like a very slow lava lamp uh, of material, and it just builds these volcanic systems, and it builds them, and it builds them, and it builds them. So some the largest volcanoes, uh, not only on Mars, but the entire solar system just also happen to be on Mars as well. So let's explore the very largest volcano in the solar system. But real quick, let's talk about a little bit of the history of figuring out that this was the largest volcano in the solar system. We missed it for the longest time. Mariner four, six, seven, eight, and nine, they all missed Olympus Mons. 
Uh, the so you know, three flybys, two orbiters from 1964 to 1973. It gave us some very, very fuzzy uh, images of Mars. But you know what? So what? They were the very first images, um, pretty much, of, of Mars. Our very first remote sensors as well. But they completely missed the largest volcano in the whole solar system. I call that very impressive indeed. Finally, 1975, we got our Viking landers. As they were making their way toward the planet, they were able to turn on their cameras real quick, take quick pictures as they were approaching the planet. We finally had our first images of Olympus Mons. Now, the very first images are extremely pixelated by all means, uh, but thankfully we have much better images of our beautiful, wonderful, largest volcano in the solar system, Olympus Mons. It is monstrous. So the base of this thing can swallow the state of Arizona, and then the height of it is just absolutely monstrous. Uh, so I uh, put that into comparison. Mount St. Helens, like I said, is 1,300 meters. Olympus Mons is 21,229 meters. Big difference there. Uh, but notice something weird about the middle. So the very middle part, uh, the vent system in all this, the vent system in the middle of this is not really a perfect circle. Let me go back one here. Uh, not really a perfect circle. There seems to be multiple uh, circular features in the middle. And what's interesting is we call these nested calderas, which means this thing would have erupted several times. And we're thinking at least eight minimum, there might've been more, but some of these calderas may have covered up previous holes. Uh, so how, again, how calderas work in this case is that it would have exploded, all the lava would have emptied itself out of it, and then it collapsed and made a hole. But then it would have filled it back up again, explode again, lava, 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 and collapse. So it's almost like it was, it was having like breathing uh, exercises going on here. It was just a bunch of material and relax. Oh, here it goes again, and bunch of material out again, and relax. And it did this eight different times, so it was a very, very dynamic volcanic system. And then we have uh, its, uh, its three siblings off to the right here, um, and how these would have been aligned would have been essentially like a hot spot. You have this hot spot, make a volcano, shift, and then make the second volcano, and then the third volcano. I... So this whole volcanic region here, we call this the Tharsis region or uh, Tharsis planitia, the Tharsis region. Just the Tharsis bulge uh, is also a, a great nickname for this too. So again, all this red area is just an uplift of the, of the crust. Now, I like to work with a lot of geologic maps. This is one of the maps I get to work uh, with a lot. So every color, every different color you see here is a different geologic feature. So Mars has a lot of geology on it. But all the different kinds of pink and beigey colors that you see off to the left here, that's all lava flows. That is all different lava uh, from the from the Tharsis volcanic, uh, volcanic system. Off the right here, you may notice a, another little pink patch here. That's uh, almost like Olympus Mons uh, sibling, uh, other sibling. It's uh, Elysium Mons is the other volcanic type there. All right, onward to Ceres. So Ceres is, uh, is definitely an interesting gateway between uh, the heavy metal terrestrial planetary systems. Now we're starting to get into the asteroid belt, which is that cross between heavy metals and rocky systems and into ice uh, and salt as well. So Ceres with the Lonely Mountain, sad face, this is Ahuna Mons. So Ahuna, why we call this the Lonely Mountain is we're thinking that this is a weird salt dome. And we do consider this to be a source of cryovolcanism. And I'll, I'll talk about cryovolcanism here in a bit. But Think of it this way, it's kind of like a salt dome. You have a very briny, salty, water icy liquid solution that would have just built up and built up and built up and make a dome. So we do consider this volcanism because it is some sort of subsurface material that built a nitty bitty mountain. 
Now, why is it the only mountain, though? Could there have been others and they all collapsed and formed calderas? Yes. Is it possible that there were many of them and then they all got obliterated by impacts and Ahuna is just the lucky one? Yes. Do we know which one is the correct theory? No. Uh, but we do know that there's a lot of salt with Ahuna. And so now we're realizing, oh, wait a moment. We consider salt to be actually a very weak substance, but maybe salt would actually be considered almost like a cement on series. So that's something that we're still uh, trying to figure out, uh, especially in the laboratory sense and trying to recreate some of this um, salty briny mixtures and, and test its, uh, its cement strength. Very cool stuff that we can do in a, in a laboratory, to be sure. All right, so Io. Oh, goodness. So Io is a disgusting itty bitty little moon. Oh, my goodness. Very sulfur based. Uh, so that's why it's a disgusting moldy cheese color. Uh, but it's very, very dynamic. It is the most volcanically active body in the whole solar system. As tiny as it is, it really packs a punch. And all the little uh, dots that you see on the surface there, those are all calderas because sulfur is such a very naturally soft compound that it can't build mountains at all it can't build mountains it can't keep them structurally upright so what io does is that it forms calderas almost immediately it would open up its surface like a pore uh, and uh, and just kind of spray out material like geysers and then just collapse immediately. And it would just keep doing that over and over again. Uh, so in 1997 with the Galileo mission, and then in 2007 with the New Horizons mission, we got two separate occasions, nearly a pretty much a decade apart. Uh, and, uh, and just to see what kind of plume structures came out of it, how hot these things would have been. Um, and it's, it's very fascinating to compare two completely different missions uh, and just how dynamic Io is. And what's cool is that these two plumes are in different parts of the moon. That was actually just figured out uh, maybe like three or four years ago. So very recent. And we're still trying to figure out what to do with Io. Now, Io uh, was almost in the running to have its own mission. Uh, the Io Volcano Observatory, or IVO, uh, but it lost to Veritas and Da Vinci. Now I'll talk about Veritas and Da Vinci here in a bit. Um, but this is what this is what its uh, its own scab uh, system looks like on Io. So you would have just these uh, these instant collapses, and then it would kind of uh, scab itself over real quick, um, like it does off to the left here, and then it would explode again and, and scab over and explode and so on. So it's a it's an interesting dynamic. Icky little moon. <laughs> I'm not biased. I uh, so onward to cryovolcanism. Now we're gonna get into ice. I uh, so how do you even just have very simple ice compounds? You have your H2O, but it's not just H2 in the in the outer solar system. You can have nitrogen, methane, ethane, uh, ammonia, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide. But you have very very simple compounds really not that much terribly complex until we get to Titan. Then Titan is just weird all on its own. I'll get to Titan here in a bit. But just taking very simple ice compounds, how do you make ice behave like rock to form mountains and glaciers and valleys and volcanic systems on these icy bodies? And so that's a little bit about what I do um, at, at Goddard is just to figure out what, what makes ice bendy uh, and, uh, and thermodynamically structured uh, like this. So ice volcanoes. Uh, so right now we don't have a clear cut definition of cryovolcanoes. Uh, our basic definition right now is that if it's ice, and stuff explodes onto the surface, whether in geyser form or puddling or anything, that's pretty much cryovolcanism. And as long as it involves ice of some sort, it doesn't matter if it involves organics or salts, uh, silicates, doesn't matter. As long as it involves ice and stuff spewing forth out of the ground, 
and it's cryovolcanism. Uh, so we realized, though, that there's so many different kinds of cryovolcanism uh, that we have still have to figure out its chemistry, what's even considered cryolava on some of these different moons and bodies. So back in 2018, we had uh, a meeting. It was like a four and a half day meeting in Houston, Texas, uh, for all of us cryovolcanic people to meet and almost have like a think tank and figure out like, okay, we're, we're going to figure out the definition of cryovolcanism. We're going to try to figure this out. And, you know, what, where are we in our knowledge? What's, what's still to be done? We did not come out of there with a definition. We came out of there with way more questions than answers. <laughs> and so that was fun. Uh, if anything, it keeps us on the job for many years to come. Hopefully we'll have another meeting like this uh, in, in the coming years. But what was fascinating is that we realized, wait a moment, there are many different ways for ice and slush and, and cryo magma to reach the surface. We're realizing it's, it's not a clear cut uh, process whatsoever. What pushes that underlying material to spew forth? So this is our, our basic areas of, uh, of how that happens, whether we have convection, where you have very warm ice uh, uh, going upward, and then it, as it cools down, it'll sink back down and you create like this convection. Um, melt lenses are a bit weird, but we're thinking melt lenses are probably what's happening on Ceres. Uh, maybe melt lenses a little bit on uh, Triton and Pluto. Fracture propagation, you would get a lot of that with geyser systems on Europa and Enceladus. Exolution is personally my favorite. Exolution means bubbles. Uh, so we may have exolution of bubbles on Titan and maybe a little bit on Pluto as well. So, or you could have combinations of these, which doesn't make things easier. <laughs> No, <laughs> no, why, why would it? Uh, so, so kind of going briefly through the outer solar system with a lot of these icy moons. Um, this, is a, this is a gorgeous moon, Europa of Jupiter. And there's little itty bitty salt domes. Now, yes, there are geysers on Europa, but we don't have a keen sense of how those geysers are, are really formed. We don't have enough data about the geysers. The best we have is from the Hubble Space Telescope. It's very pixelated. We were able to confirm that there's H2O geysers with Europa, but we need a better sense of, of how geyser systems work. So I'm not including that here for now, uh, but I will get to Europa on its own mission coming up uh, pretty soon. But another type of volcanism we have on Europa are salt domes. So similar to the salt uh, Ahuna Mons on Ceres. And then we have these itty bitty salt domes uh, all over the surface of Europa. Now, heading all over to Enceladus, Enceladus is a crowd favorite because of its geysers and all because of these lovely tiger stripes. Its more official geologic name are sulky, uh, but that's kind of weird to say. So we're going to just call these tiger stripes in the southern hemisphere of Enceladus. And how these work is that the uh, um, fractures here would essentially breathe as soon as they open out. Uh, it's very pressurized hot water vapor uh, to, to geyser outward like a, like a beautiful curtain like that. And then it would close up and then open and close and open and close. Uh, so we got a lot of this beautiful data, a lot of the chemistry from the Cassini mission, rest in peace Cassini. Uh, but a lot of that geyser systems uh, really, really helped us out. Um, so whether they have some master biological implications is is something to look forward to. Uh, hopefully we'll, we'll get back to Enceladus at a later time. Um, but for now, we, we don't know when that will be. So onward to Titan. So Titan is a very, very weird moon of Saturn. It is uh, the only moon in the whole solar system to have a very thick atmosphere. It has its own uh, weather system. It has its own uh, uh, methane cycle. Uh, so how the methane cycle works. Think about how the water cycle works here on Earth. You have clouds and it rains, it fills up the lakes, which then feeds into the oceans, and then it evaporates and forms the clouds again, and you've got your water cycle. Turns out it happens the same way on Titan, which is awesome. Here's the thing, Titan 
is about 90 Kelvin. So we're talking negative 370 some degrees Fahrenheit. Very, very cold. So water is not liquid at those temperatures whatsoever. Very, very solid water ice. However, methane, just CH4, methane acts just like a liquid on Titan, it acts just like water. So it has beautiful lake sides and beaches um, and river systems and, and uh, river valleys all over Titan. It's, it's absolutely gorgeous. Uh, and, and it does rain. We do uh, have confirmation of rainstorms uh, uh, that happen on Titan as well. So Titan is just a very cool um, moon in general. So from the Cassini mission, though, unfortunately, because of its very thick atmosphere, we uh, we didn't really plan to peer through the clouds that much on Titan. Very, very few flybys of Titan, unfortunately. So what we were able to get is this very grainy, low-res radar images um, that we see here. But from those radar images, we were able to glean, like, you know, what, what are some of these structures? And we may consider this to be a possible cryovolcano. We do know it's a bit of a mountain. It looks that there tends to be a vent in the middle. And then all of the stuff that's kind of spewing to the um, upper right angle here might be some cryo lava popping out of it. If anybody is a Lord of the Rings fan out there, this is actually Doom Mons, named after Mount Doom from the Lord of the Rings. Uh, just south of uh, Doom Mons here is Erebor, uh, Mons, uh, which is the Lonely Mountain from the Lord of the Rings series as well. <laughs> so uh, we love naming things on different moons and planets. It gets very entertaining. All right. So unfortunately, we're going to skip past the moons of, of Uranus and dive right into Triton, which is Neptune's largest captured moon uh, and uh, a cousin of Pluto, if you will. So the unfortunate part about Triton, it's such a cool moon, uh, but we barely have any images of Triton. This is probably the best image we have from Voyager 2 back in 1989. It, it being a flyby, we couldn't skip around. Uh, we couldn't orbit it or anything. It was truly just as quick as we can and take a few pictures and we're done. Uh, but what we were able to, to glean from these images from Voyager 2 are two particular areas I want to touch base on. One is that there are puddles of cryolava in a lot of these low-lying basins, so that's actually pretty cool. Um, this is a crater, but this kind of, uh, you know, weird texture in the middle here, that might have actually been a bit of a vent, uh, in which case a lot of that cryolava would have just very slowly, sluggishly, um, viscously just kind of uh, puddled around and filled the basin. And then you had these dark streaks. And there for a while, it was like, what is going on here? Are they just random streaks across the surface? What is this? I, and it turns out these are geysers. These are just a little itty bitty nitrogen carbon dioxide mixed geysers. So what happens with nitrogen and carbon dioxide? We actually see the same thing on Mars uh, as well, too. Mars has a very interesting spring uh, ritual, if you will, where little pockets of nitrogen and carbon dioxide will just kind of go poof, and it makes a little black dust. Um, because how nitrogen and carbon dioxide mix, if they're kept under frost for too long, they'll actually uh, turn a bit blackish. So we do see that here as well, but how they're formed is still under debate. We don't know whether these are formed from the inside out or from the outside in. So inside out would mean uh, some sort of tidal interaction with Neptune and materials would have uh, heated up the underside of the crust and burst forth these geysers. Or is it from the outside in where you have sublimation going on? So you have solar radiation beaten down on the surface. Yes, uh, these surfaces even out at Pluto can get sunburned <laughs> in a sense. Uh, so solar radiation beating down on the surface and just, just kind of chipping away, sunburning just a very, very tiny few centimeters of the surface, and that's all you need to then make the material go pop and pop like popcorn. Uh, so that's still under debate. I just saw it real quick in the chat. Yes, a rest in peace, uh, the Triton mission. That was also another mission that was competing against the uh, the chosen Venus missions as well. So that that would have been a really cool uh, mission to be sure. 
Now onward to uh, Pluto real quick. So Pluto, thank you, New Horizons. I got our very beautiful, spectacular images in the summer of 2015. Uh, and uh, there's still a lot to explore with Pluto. And in the southern uh, area here, just, <laughs> just to the southwest of Sputnik Planitia, which is this big, uh, beautiful lobe area here, uh, is Wright Mons and a little tiny bit of Picard Mons, though. So Wright Mons is this uh, um, dark vent system here. All of this knobby, crunchy-looking terrain all over the place might be cryolava. And then in the shadowed area is just barely the rim of Picard Mons. We maybe just got the edging of it, though. Uh, these are not very large uh, cryovolcanoes, though, but in the sense of everywhere else, geolo uh, geologically wise on Pluto, it's fairly big. It's about four kilometers high um, or about two and a half miles high. So, yes, we have some missions uh, coming up. Very exciting. Now, not all of these missions are geared toward volcanism, but what these missions will gain in our knowledge of these planetary surfaces can help with understanding the volcanic system. So we have uh, the beautiful Da Vinci and Veritas missions. So Veritas is going to be the orbiter. Um, so Veritas will indeed be looking more at like how do plate tectonics may or may not have worked on Venus, um, if there was anything like plate tectonics on Venus. Um, and then what are the different kinds of rock types? What are the different compositions? Um, in the more volcanic areas and non-volcanic areas. So Veritas will help us with volcanism systems. Da Vinci is more of an atmospheric probe. Um, it will be dropped and then just look at the different kinds of chemistry in the different layers. That can essentially help with volcanic systems because we want to figure out how much output uh, those volcanoes may have brought forth into the atmosphere, especially a lot of sulfur uh, or more acidic uh, minerals into the atmosphere. Europa Clipper, so Europa will have its own mission. Uh, its main purpose is going to really figure out uh, the different ice uh, and ocean, interior ocean of Europa, but in understanding the ocean, maybe we'll get some good ideas about how geysers would work on Europa. And then we have Titan Dragonfly. So Dragonfly is going to be a fantastic mission. It's a giant quadcopter that's going to bounce around the surface of Titan. Uh, so again, not necessarily for volcanic systems, but to better understand the surface. What is the surface really made out of? Um, what makes the surface uh, sticky or fluffy? Uh, what kind of salts? Uh, may also be on Titan as well. We do assume that there's a bit of salt, um, not table salt. Uh, sodium wouldn't really be necessarily uh, out there, out in the outer solar system that much. Uh, but there are different kinds of salts that would be found on Titan. Uh, there are several books if you do want to know uh, more about the volcanic systems on other planets. Uh, Mars, a volcanic world from Springer, and then the Pluto system after New Horizons, a beautiful big textbook uh, from the New Horizons mission team uh, and others like myself uh, that have um, kind of contributed some of those chapters. So by all means, this is not the all-encompassing questions to be asking um, for future volcanic systems, but this is just a very short, uh, broad stroke list. Um, so you know, what do we know about the different flows of volcanic systems? You know, why does Pluto cryolava look so chunky like that while Triton looks very smooth and, and puddling like that? while they both have very similar ices. What what could be the difference there? Um, could lava tubes essentially house some sort of astrobiology or can they even improve astrobiology? And that would be more toward the moon and Mars. Um, how does salt really play a role? I didn't really quite touch base on this though, but ammonia uh, is such a big component of cryolava. So how does ammonia play a role in a, a lot of this? Um, and then glass. Glass is a very uh, interesting component of volcanism on the moon and Mars. 
So how does glass form? And then how can glass be mitigated as far as risk goes to future explorers? And much, much more. Uh, so that is all I have for this evening. Uh, thank you so much for having me this evening chat about space volcanoes. I hope you all had, had fun and, uh, and I hope that I can answer any questions you all may have. Thank you so much. Caitlin, thank you. Thank you so much, man. It's just, uh, we live in a crazy place. I mean, I'm not just saying the earth, but uh, I mean, it's just, it's just wonderful, all of the, uh, the uh, diversity in our solar system. And it's like, it's hard to imagine what some of these places are like, you know, to, to be there. Um, so thank you for taking the time. I want to go to the chat room here and see. Um, I've got a couple questions, but I'm going to go down. I'm going to see what David, David Worth, um, I think you're still on. You wanted to ask about some, uh, you want to ask your question? Sure. Good evening, Dr. Ahrens. Um, I was thinking kind of X volcano questions. Um, are there any, have we seen anything like uh, the Monadnock uh, remnants, like Shiprock in the Navajo Reservation and Monument Valley, the remains of the core of volcanoes on Mars? Possibly. Possibly. So Shiprock is indeed um, visited often, uh, also by planetary geologists as well. Um, it's a nice analogy to some of those volcanic systems. Now, whether we consider them to be cores of volcanoes on Mars is still under uh, observation, you know, TBD on that one. Uh, but it still gives us a great area to explore and go like, okay, how did this work on Earth? And then maybe figure out how could this have worked on Mars? So right now it's a maybe. <laughs> Do we have any idea if if Olympus Mons and other volcanoes are, are extinct on Mars? Do we have any idea about how long ago they they expired? Very good question. So yes, we do think that they have expired. Uh, a lot about the interior has been helped from the Insight mission uh, to figure out uh, seismic activity on Mars, and we realize that it's not as it's active, but the best you're going to get is about a magnitude four. Uh, so really not that powerful of, of major shaking or, or anything. Um, so what that does tell us is that there's just very minor um, shaking. There may be some very recent tectonic activity in a sense of just the crust moving, but not necessarily building up of magma and getting ready to, to push forward and lava flows everywhere. No, we're, we're pretty sure Mars is, is done with that. Its core is very slow, um, almost still. <laughs> so I, I don't think it's going to be that active anymore. Now, when did it stop is still um, to be determined as well, because we're realizing that Olympus Mons uh, had so many flows that it's hard to distinguish which flows would be the youngest versus the oldest. And right now... Um, mineral mapping is very helpful. We don't have a lot of mineral maps. Most of the mineral maps are from the Mars Global Surveyor back in the early 90s. The problem with that, though, is that it was very low resolution. And I used to work with the Mars Global Surveyor, so that's hard for me to say. I love that mission. Uh, but, uh, but more current mineral maps from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, much higher resolution, but it's still ongoing. We're still needing more and more mineral maps. So again, TBD <laughs> on that one. Thank you. Hey, Caitlin, just real quick on, on, I guess on Mars, you know, it seems like it'd be fun to visit Olympus Mons, but I don't ever hear about trying to go there. And maybe it's because, you know, we're looking for life and we don't think it'll be there. Is that kind of the reason or? Yep, pretty much. Yeah. So, so the, how, <laughs> how the current funding works is is uh, I, there's a really funny slogan that we're using right now. It's uh, follow the water. Uh, and so we would know that Olympus Mons wouldn't have that much water. Um, it'd be really neat to go there. Uh, but in terms of, of astrobiology, that's not where you wouldn't want to go. You wouldn't want to go to somewhere that would have been a previous lake system of some sort. 
Now there was one area that had competed against Jezero Crater, um, which would have been uh, around the Sirtis major volcanic province. And it would have been a, a volcanic province that's really close to um, glacial water, paraglacial areas. That would have been really cool, but nope, Jezero Crater won the bid. So, <laughs> you know, who knows? If there could be a volcanic uh, mission to Mars, that would be... Just need a bigger drone maybe next time, huh? There you that'd go. be neat. <laughs> Yeah, so let's go. Let's see, George, you've got your hand up physically and on. Yeah. So. Uh, where does the methane come from that's been detected on Mars? Very good question. So, yes, that's still very much a big debate uh, because it, do we suspect that there could be pockets of methane in the subsurface, very much like pockets of nitrogen and carbon dioxide? Yeah, sure. It might have been just the pocket would have been exposed and made its own like little methane geyser so that's mm. a good theory another uh possible theory is that you have little itty bitty organics called methanogens and methanogens are little itty bitty weird organisms that hate oxygen mars is perfect great there's no oxygen on mars it's perfect mm. and what they do is that they actually breathe in carbon dioxide and essentially belch out methane so if you get enough of the cluster of these little itty bitty guys uh, it's a burp out enough methane. It might be detectable. Who knows? Um, there are very few laboratories in the U.S. that look at these particular organisms um, under Martian conditions in the laboratory. And it's it's very exciting work. Uh, but that's also a theory as well. So is it organic or is it purely geyser rock uh, that has just been exposed? Um, or both? Isn't the quantity of it variable? Does it vary or do we, do we not know? We, yeah, we, we don't know. We were hoping it was regional. Um, quite a few years back, I believe there was like a methane spike uh, right. in one particular part <laughs> of ours. And it was like, oh, there's a, a methane cloud all of a sudden that just kind of appeared. And, and could it have been from an impact? And we, we rolled out an impact. And mm -hmm. uh, what, what did this plume mean? Turns out we still don't really know. Mm -hmm. um, but could it have been organisms? Probably not to that scale. Mm -hmm. um, could it have been a geyser mixed with something with the solar wind? Mm -hmm. Possibly. We're now getting a lot of a better understanding of how the Mars atmosphere works due to MAVEN uh, or, or one of our latest atmosphere missions to Mars. Mm -hmm. We're realizing that there's a lot to the Martian atmosphere that we really don't know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, thank, thanks, George. All right, we'll go to, uh, we'll go to Lewis, and then we'll go to Skylar, um, and then a few more in the chat box. So, so Lewis. Hi, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Aaron. It's nice to meet you, and thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I'm a film major, actually, at George Mason, pursuing a career in science communication, and I I wanted to ask you if you have any advice for communicating complex scientific information in an engaging and effective way as you did so uh, brilliantly this evening. Oh my goodness. <laughs> uh, so that in itself, very basic answer is honestly just to have fun with it. As long as you find the topic interesting, then communicating that forward should be just as fun as well. Uh, but in more detail, I'm ha also happy to chat with you um, outside of this meeting as well. You're, you're, feel free to email me and we can have a, a Zoom chat about science communication because it's it's such a very important uh, thing to be sure, um, especially in this day and age and everything being virtual. So happy to chat with you uh, outside of the, the Google chat here about science communication. Um, Thank you but, so much. But my main advice is, whatever really just fascinates you because that fascination um, will show up in your writing. If, if you're just like, I know nothing well, about methanogens on Mars, eh, it's, it's going to seem like a homework assignment and it's going to show up in your, in your reading and just your reaction to it. It's going to show. So as long as you have a fascination with it, you're like, Oh, this looks cool. It's going to reflect into whatever you produce. 
Thank you so much. And I will absolutely email you. I really appreciate that. Cool. Paul can give you my email. Yeah, yeah I'll connect you. Thank you, Paul. Those. Yeah, it's super. Your, your, your enthusiasm is so evident, Caitlin, that it makes it fun. Even if we only understand a fraction of what you understand, it's, it's still fun. So uh, that was a great answer. Question you probably didn't expect to get here tonight, but. I enjoy it. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> okay, Skylar, let's go to Skylar. Well, hello, Dr. Ernst. Um, wonderful presentation. Yeah, enthusiasm is very contagious. Um, <laughs> I had one question about um, the meetings that you had at um, Goddard about like the definition. What was that like? Like just to sit around with the brilliant minds that the world has to offer and trying to figure out what, how exactly are we going to identify this? What was that like? Um, the first word that comes to mind mm -hmm. is very humbling. Um, yeah. Because you're in a room with people who have legitimately worked on the Voyager missions and the New Horizons missions, and and just having those the the you know pieces of history, people, um, but be on the same level of, I have no idea what this is. I don't know what's going on. Let's figure it out. And so it was very humbling, if anything, to just be kind of all on the same playing field of. Well, we don't know. Let's figure it out. Uh, and again, we left that that meeting with way more questions uh, than answers. But it was it was very interesting to then see the progression of how do we ask these questions, how do we go about answering them. Uh, we're realizing that there needs to be a lot more lab work, experimental work. Uh, so that's a little bit about what I did during my PhD is uh, I recreated Pluto in, in my laboratory. <laughs> it's extremely difficult to do. <laughs> uh, you try to get down to negative 380 degrees Fahrenheit in a laboratory, it's not that quite easy. Uh, but figuring out how do you make this ice and then a dash of salt and a dash of ammonia and see what happens. Again, I'm making it sound glorious and easy. It's not. <laughs> but then what do you learn from that? and why we should learn from that. Uh, that. That was definitely something we got out of that meeting was the, the how and, uh, and the why. <laughs> oh, wow. Thank you so much. That's very insightful. It sounds like a fun career to have. It, it gets very interesting. And, and this happens with almost every conference as well. We actually have our, our largest planetary conference uh, in two weeks. Actually, that, that I'll be presenting at and a, a couple hundred of us planetary people are going to be at all in Houston. This is our Lunar and Planetary Science Conference that happens every March. Uh, and, uh, and it's still just one giant think tank of this is what we know. This is what we don't know. Uh, you know what, what direction do we need to be in? Um, what missions should we start proposing um, for the next short-term years to long-term years uh we really do want a mission to uranus and neptune uh so that, oh, yeah, that's absolutely. a big goal um but then getting ready for venus as well we have three big venus missions um two from nasa one from the european space agency so trying to prep ourselves to get ready for for venus venus is such a weird weird planet i may be doing some venus volcano work this summer i'm, I'm, I'm not sure on that quite yet <laughs> it's very very difficult chemistry oh yeah that's a thick cloud to get through yeah yeah a little bit <laughs> yeah so if that's someone can tell me the chemistry i'll be fine <laughs> but uh, you know my chemistry knowledge can only go so far and it's mostly ice since yeah. no ice on venus i'm pretty much stuck <laughs> oh, well okay. thank you so much thanks skylar uh in the chat box R rosetta stone you're still on you want to ask your question Uh, this was about Venus, um, and it had to deal with lightning. And Ooh. is there a relationship between lightning and volcanism? Okay, so the thing about lightning is that we only saw it once on a data set that no one can really properly do anything about. So did we really see lightning is honestly one of the the not main questions of Venus, but it's still a question about Venus's. Did we really see that? And if we did, 
why doesn't it happen often? I, we should have been able to see it with a lot of our orbiters, especially with Akatsuki, um, which is the Japanese uh, Venus orbiter. We have Bepi Colombo um, going about Venus right now as well. Uh, and still no more evidence of Venus. So are we just very unlucky? <laughs> Trying to photograph lightning uh, is, is just as hard on Earth. You know, are we just truly just, we blinked and we missed? Uh, or is it really under the thick clouds and we're, it's not flashing in the upper atmosphere as much as we think it is? We just don't understand the lightning um, at all. Now, could it be volcanic lightning? That would be really cool, but probably not. Uh, but could lightning strike and form um, similar to something called fulgurite? Uh, if you've ever been to like a rock and mineral show, fulgurites are very, uh, very fun and very popular. It's just fused sand from the heat of lightning. Um, so fulgurites, could there be fulgurite type stuff on Venus? We don't know. We don't know how far down the lightning would have fit or even how powerful this lightning would be. Uh, so, so I guess the, the short answer to that would be like, well, we don't know. <laughs> any, any thought on why there aren't any volcanoes on Mercury? Is it just an old surface or an old um, core start or? Yeah, that, uh, so someone, someone mentioned the core. Yeah, so the core itself wouldn't have been that dynamic to make a very active uh, convection like mantle to build up these materials. So that's that's one major part. And then the minor part in that is a lot of a lot of the composition on, on Mercury is graphite. Um, so very soft carbon minerals. If anybody wants a pencil from Mercury, go right ahead. There's a plenty of graphite. Uh, so wouldn't that make for an interesting Mm. Yeah, purchase there. Uh, but uh, but graphite is a naturally soft, um, fluffy compound, so it wouldn't make a very good cement to make a mountain. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, Emily, Emily Thorne, good question she's got. Do you want to ask it? Hi, yeah, I was just um, wondering if you'd be able to detect any volcanoes on exoplanets with the James Webb Space Telescope and about how far will the James Webb Space Telescope be able to detect? Ah, okay. So <laughs> this is a yes and no answer. Ha <laughs> ha. Uh, so specifically with volcanism on exoplanets, no. Um, J, uh, JWST is not going to be that helpful for figuring out the actual surfaces of exoplanets. It's going to mostly look at, at atmospheres. But in understanding the atmospheres and the distance from their, their host stars, understanding the middlicity of these host stars as well, we can get from JWST as well. Um, so knowing distance from host star, the metals involved, and what kind of atmosphere we're dealing with, we can then theorize if there could be volcanic systems. Say if there's like a huge random spike of sulfur of an atmosphere. Yeah, that's a pretty good idea that that's, that has something to do with volcanism. Or even silicates, um, uh, aluminum, uh, and, and like quartz silica uh, type atmospheres yeah, that would also be really good for, for volcanism as well. But say if you get something like ammonia or methane, um, probably not. Uh, or we wouldn't have a better idea if that's volcanism or is that just a very, very typical um, mini gas giant uh, type exoplanet uh, in that sense. So that, that in its sense is like a maybe, but not like yes that's a volcano exoplanet yes no probably not i uh, how far will it be able to detect oh goodness i think that was a question that was brought up like right before the meeting and uh, and i personally don't i uh, know that because it is gonna see certainly farther than hubble space telescope the thing about jws2 is because it's looking farther it's it's, it's definitely going to be nearsighted. 
Um, so it's not going to look within our own solar system. Um, it's, it's not even going to look at Pluto. That's not going to be its purpose. So anything past Pluto, it's going to be fine. Um, but Hubble itself was able to get like, you know, barely some pixels out of Pluto and go, look, there's Pluto. Okay. No, JWST is not going to do that. It wants to look further. Um, and definitely for exoplanets too. So yeah. hope that helps. <laughs> it did. Yeah. It's really exciting. Like, like you said, with the atmosphere. So it's a start. <laughs> it's, it's a start. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. There, and there's like a, a, there's a whole branch of, um, of, uh, uh, do you like exoplanets? Um, I do. I, right now, um, well, I'm an astrophysics major at Mason. So my interests are kind of like all over the place right now. Exoplanets are really awesome. I know there's a lot of research done here with exoplanets. So yeah, I have pretty much like everything. <laughs> Email me um, because there's a there's a group specifically for graduate students who just like exoplanets and it's free to join. Um, so I highly encourage you to to join. Um, so email me and I will send you the uh, the membership list. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank thanks Emily. Emily's one of our new uh, newest members and uh, as she said, a student over at uh, George Mason. So. Great things will come from from Emily, I'm sure, in uh, in this astronomy and yeah, astronomy world. So, thanks for the question, David. David Baxter, question on salt. So, you talked about how the different types of ice flow and rise or or not. I'm just wondering, is there any idea do we, how much the concentrations of these salts are? Because, I mean, presumably that matters. Um, you know, because how much salt you put in the water here, you know, makes a big difference and when it freezes. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, so let's go to series then. So series, it's very much just table salt. Uh, you got your sodium chlorides. Uh, you have a little bit of magnesium chlorides as well, but magnesium chlorides, a uh, very, very tiny percentage though. But uh, Salt-wise, at, at least Ahuna Mons, we're thinking it's at least 10% worth of table salt. So that's a pretty good salty mountain, uh, a big table salt mountain on, on Ceres. Uh, but is that amount of salt all over the surface of Ceres? No. Could it be higher concentrations in the subsurface of Ceres? Yes. Uh, so again, back to the why did Ahuna Mons form in that just particular region, and could there have been more? Sure, yeah. Um, but did salt play a role in it? Yeah. So we we realized that table salt in particular, the sodium chloride, can act like a really cool cement uh, with it. And there's a little bit of ammonia um, uh, in uh, in that salt as well. Now ammonia gets way way bigger salt form in the outer solar system. We see a lot of ammonia salt on Pluto. Uh, and that plays a big role because ammonia acts just like an antifreeze. Um, so why we would put rock salt uh, on our sidewalks, uh, you know, fairly recently uh, kind of deal and to help thaw out the, the snow and the freezing. Same thing happens on Pluto. You have a lot of ammonia, it brings down that uh, freezing of water and methane and nitrogen and carbon monoxide on Pluto. The interesting part about ammonia though, out at Pluto, it's no longer a cement type salt. Instead, the more ammonia that you have, the more slushy and gooey things are going to be. Um, so now we're dealing with different kinds of salts and what could they be mixed in with. Um, so series, you got your sodium chloride with water ice, nice big cement. Uh, but then out at Pluto, your ammonia um, and methane, really runny, just gushing. <laughs> uh, but the more water ice you still add to the mix, your water ice acts like the cement much, much better. Um, so ammonia would have to play a role in why it looks all chunky. Uh, and Nobby looking around right Mons, but you would have to have very little ammonia, very little methane, and a lot of water ice to make it kind of chunky like that. Awesome. Thank you so much. And uh, obviously, we all think you had a great presentation, so thank you for that. 
<laughs> Thank you. I think I think we've already booked you for the Mars uh, talk later in the year, whenever you can find the time. Uh, let's see. Um, I know we had one from Alex. Where's Alex? Alex, are you still on? I'm here. Yeah. Dr. Aarons, thank you. I'm in humbled awe, as probably are all of us, at the fact that your research exists and uh, the depth of it. Um, so I have a question. Um, in 1958, there's Professor Kozarev in Soviet Union. He claimed to have observed an active volcano on the moon through a spectroscope. Has anything happened with that? Like he, he was, uh, it was pretty controversial at the time. This was also the guy that was charting in the Gulag snow the uh, formula for luminosity of stars. So he was, it was pretty unusual. But uh, is that even possible, as far as you know? I so what may have happened was he may have either seen just some sort of um there's two possibilities of what he may have seen he may have either seen uh an impact uh in the aftermath of an impact and the ejecta puffing forward um we've tried this out with the L cross mission much much later on um to test that theory of can we on earth see an impact uh, if we made our own impact on the moon, and we can. Uh, so that's one possibility. Another possibility is that the moon um, hates the sun. <laughs> so uh, the, the equator of the moon uh, will get sunburned enough where volatiles, so little tiny little ice crystals, will puff forward and move itself to the poles and then crystallize. And this is where we get a lot of ice at the poles of the moon. Um, so he may have also seen just one of those se very, very seasonal, and you have to be very quick about it too, but he may have seen a sort of seasonal migration of the, the little ice crystals popping up and quickly trying to bounce itself to the pole where it's nice and cold and, <laughs> and accumulate there. Uh, so that, that can happen um, as well. So volcanically, no, unfortunately not. That would have been cool, but no. I uh, know a lot of the domes are so tiny, you wouldn't be able to really see an eruption. Um, most of these domes you can catch on a CCD camera, by all means. Um, and uh, there's some uh, great Italian astronomers with CCD cameras that this is what they do. And you can actually just Google their, um, their lunar dome atlas and just see where on the moon and uh, what type of CCD cameras that they use and everything. Beautiful astrophotography from that. But to catch a, a plume or a lava flow or anything, ah, to be so tiny, uh, I, I doubt it. It would be dome related um, or cones even. They're so cute, so tiny, but probably not active anymore. <laughs> you would say the consensus is moon is not um, volcanically active. Volcanically be. active, no. Tectonically mm -hmm. active, um, possibly. So not plate tectonics, um, not in that sense, but to have active faults and uh, graben systems and lava tube formations and everything or collapses thereof. Yes, that's actually uh, an interesting consensus that we're having right now is how fresh and, and relatively young by a couple thousands of years young. Uh, could these things be tectonically active on the moon? Maybe even today as well? We're still kind of using some of the seismic uh, uh, experiments from the Apollo missions. Do we need more seismometers? Yes, there's a mission concept right now called the, geophysical, or the Lunar Geophysical Network. It's going to be an array of seismometers um, on the moon that's, uh, fingers crossed, going to be an actual mission. Right now, it's still in concept, um, what we call storyboard um, mode right now. So it's still still trying to gain support. But that would be cool if we had like a whole array of seismometers, then we can get a better sense of it, how tectonically active is the moon right now. <laughs> Thank you very much. Cool. Um, anybody else have questions? I know we've kind of held you over, Caitlin. Sorry about that. But, uh, <laughs> it's fine. This is very fun. <laughs> your, uh, this is your thing. So, no, super interesting. Um, I want to, George, you have a question too? Yeah, you know, I guess that there must be some discussion of making an instrument that can actually swallow up some of these plumes. 
the material in the plumes and see if there's any life in there. Okay. Yes, very good question. Uh, so yes, there are concepts to do that very specifically. Um, the issue though is do we want to have it as a flyby and what's considered a sample return mission? So that is definitely a big like, yes, we want to do that. Um, there's there's a lot of concepts with that. I myself am actually helping write a paper on sample returns mm -hmm. for all the four geysers. So Good job and good timing because I am writing that. Uh, but there's also um, a concept going around, should we do something similar to deep impact where we impact into uh, a geyser system and see what what comes out and mm -hmm. do a quick chemical analysis, not to return obviously, because once you impact it, you're, uh, you're dead. Uh, but similar to deep the deep impact mission. So, so it's kind of a, you want to go the cheap and easy route, you would do t uh, deep impact. But if you really want to understand more of the organics, um, I, a lot of the ice is involved in everything, you would do a sample return. Uh, there's a lot of pros and cons with both. If you want to do cheap and easy, you're going to have somewhat lower resolution instruments and, and data, but you may get a lot more data. As if you do the sample return, you may not get a lot of sample to return. And also returning said sample is incredibly difficult uh, as well. So yeah. pros and cons there. Do we want to do it? Yes. <laughs> How are we going to do it? No idea yet. Anybody else? Um, any other um, questions? Oh, uh, this, this Victor. Yeah, Victor. I have a, I have a, a question. I, that's just something from science fiction. They're saying that Valus Marineris has caves, you know, and uh, and they, and the people. I forget what movies they were, but they you know, that's one place they were able to find shelter. What do you think the chances are of finding any openings in Valus Mar Marineris? Uh, interesting that you said that. So there is actually a whole uh, tiny, well, I shouldn't say whole because it sounds large, a, a fairly small working group specifically for planetary caving uh, within NASA. And that's their whole purpose is to figure out well, where is the caves and where's the best spelunking places in the solar system. Ah. Uh, so they are actively looking for cave systems on Mars. They actually have a beautiful catalog of caves on the moon and Mars. Uh, and we call them skylights, but they're also looking into lava tubes as well. Mm -hmm. um, I myself have been, I uh, may be working on lava tubes on the moon in the fall. <laughs> so, uh, mm -hmm. so could there be caves around Dallas mm -hmm. Mariners? I'm not entirely sure that there are yet, but I do know that they are still actively searching for caves just in general around Mars. And then they group themselves into how they're formed. Um, what's the extent of cave systems? Are they just straight down or do they go into networks? Um, what could have caused collapses in some of these lava tubes as well? So you would have to learn about the, the mineralogy and the chemistry of, of the rocks and everything in that particular place. Is it near water? Is it not? Uh, so, so it's a it's a whole neat working group to look at planetary caving systems. So, it's a thing. <laughs> but around Dallas Mariners, I personally don't know. The moon, the moon has a lot of uh, what do you call it? Lava tubes. Some of them collapsed and whatever. There's a astronomer at Goddard, Winifred Cameron. I don't know if you know her. She worked there in the seventies, and seventies, um, maybe even eighties. And uh, so she, she was very interested in that. Also, something about the Marius Hills, you know, looking for, uh, there, was a, there was a mission, an Apollo mission that was supposed to land there, but they canceled it. And uh, that could have been, except it was a high latitude, maybe that was the problem with it. Probably. Um, so we had thought about going back to Marius uh, Hills, but then we found Grutizen uh, domes, which are much larger and a little bit easier to get to. Um, it's around the, the um, Oceanus uh, Procolarum area, uh, area. So much easier to get to. Somewhat similar to Marius Hills, but much larger, um, like I said, as well. So that's, that's kind of where the 
another focus is going to be instead of Marius. By all means, I wish we were good at Marius, but Grutizen um, seems to be the the better of the two. He's with you, but yeah. Yeah, but right now we're solely focused on the Southern Pole uh, a lot. Right now with the moon, that that's where most of our missions are going to go. Uh, but Groot Heisen, it's it's on the list. It's just going to take a few years. <laughs> Good. Thank you very much. We'll have to get Victor on that working group, maybe. I don't know. On the caves. <laughs> I'm a lot of data, for, unfortunately. I, I did all myself in the 70s and 80s. <laughs> that's okay. Um, hey, anybody else? Uh, and then I had one, one final question, uh, which uh, if anybody else has anything. Thank you so much, Caitlin, for, for hanging with us a little bit past the hour. I wanted to find out from you, like if you could put yourself on a spacecraft today and go anywhere in the solar system to, to get the most interesting thing from your vantage point, where would you go? Oh no, <laughs> I should have, should have known this question would come up. Oh no, because my answer changes almost weekly. Honestly, Triton, I think we really, really are missing out on, on Triton or any of the moons of Uranus. Um, that is a lot of missed opportunity. Uh, but the more dynamic uh, of the two, you would go to Triton. Um, the more weird chemistry you would go to the moons of Uranus. Uh, so anywhere in that particular region, we really don't know a lot about. Uh, the geology is just gorgeous. Um, Triton itself. Do we know that the geyser systems are still working nowadays? Did they change morphology since 1989? We don't know. We, we've never imaged it since so uh, so just seeing that kind of comparison between 1989 Voyager 2 to now, uh, whenever now may be, uh, would be very fascinating. Yeah. Well, it's so cool. We got to see, uh, you know, those outer planets, including Pluto. I mean, it's, it'll be a long time before we get back, but it's, it's cool to have have those images really spectacular so uh, yeah we we got lucky with pluto um believe it or not we imaged pluto right at maximum summer temperatures very balmy 60 kelvin temperatures so uh <laughs> woo wow anybody uh on pluto but i uh, but yeah so we really lucked out to getting pluto with new horizons um for as many times as new horizons tried to launch and then get canceled or mission failure or anything so yeah. Yeah. Thankful for New Horizons. <laughs> Lovely hey, mission. Caitlin, thank you. Thank you so much. It's uh I, I will we'll let you get back to your normal Sunday night dinner or what have you, but uh we really appreciate your time and uh your enthusiasm and uh just just bringing us all up to speed on on our solar system and all the cool things we have right here. So um we'll let you go and I want to, I'll invite you back, I'm sure. So um uh, it was it was terrific having you. And uh, thanks all the Novak members for, for joining. And uh, we've got outreach coming. So uh, take a look at Alvin's calendar, check out our website and uh, volunteer. So it's a lot of fun. And we'll see you not in four weeks. I think March 13th is only like three weeks away, something like that. But we'll be back on our second Sunday of the, um, second Sunday of the month uh, starting next month. So thanks, everyone. And have a have a good night.